each week, I probably go through thousands of pieces of stock market data, and there's usually about five things worth looking at. The rest is junk and noise in the background. Let me share with you the five things from the past week which I think are worth looking at and worth you looking at. So I'm going to look at the ones which, well, like I said, I think are the most important and the most eye-catching. Okay, the ones worth paying attention to, the ones which actually tell me something new that I didn't know, the ones which the rest of the market might well be missing, and I want to make sure you don't miss out on. So what are they? They are these. The first interesting piece of data, this comes out of Bloomberg Economics. It's also uh, a piece of analysis done by Robert Schiller, who has the famous CAPE, or uh, uh, Cyclically Adjusted Price to Earnings ratio, which is a measure of the overvaluation of the market. Anyway, what he's done over the last 120 odd years is gone at the, gone through the data and looked at the magenta bits, which are where there's been a bubble or crash, and where we are right now. Well, obviously, in one sense, it only tells us what we already know, that we are at extreme levels, there could be a crash. But looking at history, it's not guaranteed. There's a probability but it's not guaranteed. So in one sense, it doesn't tell us anything. In another sense, it does give us that warning not to get too complacent and certainly think that this time it's different or it won't happen, all right? Not that you were thinking that anyway, I am sure. The next thing, so away with that one, the next thing. Again, out of Bloomberg Economics, you might want to actually pause on this one. Uh, the reason is there's a lot of data there. And again, going back 100 years, what happens in the two quarters after a bubble's been detected and what happens in the two quarters after it ends? Well, the real problem happens not in the two quarters after the detection. Markets still go up. So who cares? This is the bit where everyone goes, oh, there's a bubble, there's a bubble. Well, so what? The market's still going up. So for those waiting on the sidelines, well, it's not a clever thing to do. What about the two quarters after it ends? Well, there's only a problem if it's been a boom, which it is, and it ends, because then it's going to be negative. But if it's a crash, then in the two quarters after that, the market tends to go up. So what's that telling us? It's saying at the moment, given that it's not ended, that we should ride it up. Okay, that's what it's saying, given that it's not ended. And even if it does end, if it's a crash, then we should still stay in. It's only if it's a boom that ends that we've got something to worry about. So pretty good information, actually. What about this valuation risk? Shares of profitless tech companies drop amid concerns over rising interest rates. In other words, what this is telling me is that there's a bit of a flight to quality. What is quality? Quality is the kind of companies which are, are, are profitable, which have good valuations. The things I look for, valuation, growth, cash flow growth, dividend yields, consistently outperforming the market, and so on. And what the rest of the market seems to be doing is moving towards those profitable and away from the profitless companies. In other words, people are getting less speculative, less risk-taking because the markets are ever highs. And that's sort of a graph which pretty much reinforces that for me. So dump that in the bin for a moment. What about with the hedge funds? Well, the hedge funds are doing something which I disagree with at the moment, um, in that they are carrying greater risk to higher valued stocks, higher growth. Yes, well, I want to tick the growth box, but I don't want high valuation, high growth stocks. I want medium valuation, high growth stocks. So I'm doing something they're not. And I think the reason they're taking that greater risk measured by enterprise value or EV over sales. So think of that as price over sales. Another way of looking at price over earnings, but a different measure is that is that they're going for these high value companies and those companies might be generating growth. And so they think the valuations are justified. But in actual fact, I suspect they're taking ever increasing amounts of risk and will sort of ease back on that. When they ease back, what will they do? Will they go into low growth companies? Obviously not. They'll continue with high growth companies, but they'll probably fall back into the kind of high growth companies which have got better valuations. In other words, welcome to my warm, loving arms. Uh, those are going to be the kind of companies that I look for anyway. Value, growth, income, cash flow, and the like. I've got another slide to show you, which I think is rather interesting. And I'm going to do a big reveal on this one because it's breathless. It's one of those many breathless Headlines you see, Goldman Sachs says weakening growth, rising interest rates, rich valuations, and higher taxes won't, I repeat, won't sink stocks next year. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Goldman and Mr. Sachs. But they will slow them down. Well, that's a reasonable thing to say. Here's what to buy and what to do, avoiding mistakes, blah, blah, blah. So 
they don't think it's going to crash the market. And I think that's pretty good news. If you want to have a look at some of the ones that I do tend to like, follow my Telegram channel. There'll be links somewhere to finding it uh, around this video. So follow my Telegram channel. I'll go through some of the stocks they sometimes mention to see if they tick my boxes on value, growth, and income. I want to show you one final slide. It's this one. It is some of the stocks which have risen the most since 2020, but uh, significantly off their highs. Now, one thesis could be if they've still done well since 2020, then the reason they're off their highs, maybe take a PayPal, is just some profit taking. But if the underlying company is sound and it were to go back to the losses it's made since its highs, then you might have between 90 to 100% returns. If you take the example, for instance, on that thesis of DraftKings or Palantir or Pinterest, then yes, if they go back to where they were, because they've dropped 50%, you have 100% return. It's pretty high risk. Of that list, the only one I own at the moment is PayPal. Okay, I don't have the others. And I'm not going to speculate on Twitter or any of the others unless they fall into my approved list of value, growth, cash flow, momentum, income, uh, consistent outperformance of the markets, which PayPal does. So with PayPal, it's down 40% off its highs. I fully expect that to return me from where it is at the moment. Well, to go back up. So what's that? A 66% return uh, is what I would get. If my maths is right at the top of my head. You can correct me in the comments box. So I just wanted to share that final one with you in terms of things worth looking at. Usually, stock market data is worth looking at, not because it gives you some secret insight into what you should get into, but it's to make sure you don't make the mistakes that so many people often do whether it's overconfidence or speculation or gambling or getting into the wrong areas. So it's more to keep you away from bad mistakes. Anyway, hopefully you like that. Have a look at my campaign for a million.com, campaign for a million.com, if you want to learn more and see where my Telegram channel is uh, if you're not already on it. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll try and do more of these every single week if you want them. If you do want them, put it in the comments. We'll go from a democratic perspective.